हेलो फ्रेंड्स टुडे वी विल डिस्कस स्ट्रेसिस इन इंडिविजुअल कंपोनेंट ऑफ द ट्रैक एंड द फर्स्ट इज द रेल सो ए रेल इज सब्जेक्टेड टू सेवरल टाइप्स ऑफ लोड द फर्स्ट इज द वर्टिकल लोड बिकॉज ऑफ व्हील वर्टिकल व्हील लोड एंड जनरल थ्योरी ऑफ बेंडिंग ऑफ रेल्स इज दैट द रेल इज सपोर्टेड ऑन ए नंबर ऑफ स्लीपर्स एंड when load comes it behaves like a continuous beam so if the rail section is uniform then any movement occurring in a rail because of a load p vertical load p is given by this equation where p is the wheel load vertical wheel load l is what is called characteristic length of the rail section and this l is given by Fourth rule of E I upon K, where E is the modulus of velocity of rail, I is moment of inertia, and K is track modulus. And this parameter I explained in my last session. X is the distance of the point from the wheel load. So if you have a number of loads, then the effect of one load. at any other point on the rail will change depending upon this distance x now this is the bending moment as percent of maximum bending moment and maximum bending moment is 100% here when x is 0 and this is x so it is 0 at pi and by 4 and it is 0 here also at 5 pi and by So it is important to calculate the effect of each wheel on a particular point to determine the total bending moment. For example, if you take the case of two wheels of a bogey or a wagon, that two wheels are two hundred centimeter apart. This is the distance 200 centimeter, and the wheel load is let us say 10 ton. You can augment this load for a speed if you want, or you can take in this example the dynamic load. This is also 10 ton, and let us say this point is A, this point is B. So what is the bending moment at A? Because of a load at A and because of load at B. So first we calculate bending moment at A because of this load at A. So x is zero. So bending moment at A due to load at A will be equal to P L by four because x is zero. And let's assume some values for calculation of L. Let us say E, the modulus of velocity of rail section is 3 into 10 power 6 kg per centimeter square. Modulus of inertia of rail section 1942, and let's say K value is 425. Kg per centimeter square. So we calculate L. L is fourth root of E I upon K. If you substitute these values of E I and K, it will be sixty point eight five centimeter. So any movement due to load at A will be ten into sixty point. A five divided by four, and that is equal to one fifty two ton centimeter. 
because we we have taken in tons L is in centimeters so by the moment it is in tons centimeter now if you calculate the bending moment at B because of the load at B it is the same because load is same but what is the impact of this bending moment now bending moment here is 152 now what is the impact of this here at A and that you calculate using equation using that equation that binding moment is binding moment is PL by 4 e to the power minus x by L sine x by L into cos x by L now x here is 200 centimeter L is 60.85 centimeter. So x i l will be 3.286. X i l will be 3.286. So here you can put x i l directly, but here you have to convert this into degree, and this will be. 3.286 divided by 5 into 180 degree so theta m will be equal to 188 degree now you put the values here so bending moment at A due to load at B equal to P L 60.85 divided by 4 into E to the power minus X by L 3.286 into sine 188 minus cos 188 X by L and this is 4 point plus 4.8 ton centimeter. Very marginal effect of B at A. So total bending moment at A will be equal to 152 plus 4.8 ton centimeter. That is 156 bending moment at A is 156.8 a ton centimeters. Now, if you know bending moment, you can calculate bending stress also. Bending stress is bending moment divided by section of plus J. And if you take value of J for this rail section, and let us say that value of J for this rail section is 256.95 centimeter cube, and therefore bending stress in the rail will be 156.8 divided by 256.95 and that is equal to 0 0.61 ton per centimeter square or you can say 6.1 kg per millimeter square now this must be less than the bearing stress or bending stress allowed in the rail and bending stress allowed in the rail is 23.5 kg per millimeter square. That depends upon the rail section. For a 52 kg rail, it is 23.5 kg per millimeter square. So that is how we calculate stress in the rail due to vertical load. The second type of load which a rail experiences is the indicator force. Later force. And this later force on a rail is because of two reasons. That is the V load in a ideal case should pass through the CG of the 
rate P. And if you remember, we were discussing owning of wheels in one of the earlier sessions, and I told you that there is always a gap between the wheel flange and part of the rail, and that gives a possibility of greater movement of the axle. And because of that, there is always a first thing. The force is applied by the wheel flange when it strikes side of the plate. That is lateral force. And this lateral force occurs because of lateral movement of the V. And the, when the lateral movement of the V occurs, then there is always an eccentricity in the load. E. And because of this eccentricity in the vertical load, there will be a twisting force here. P into E. That depends upon the wheel load. Wheel load is quite heavy. Eccentricity because of lateral movement of the axle and because of eccentric load, there will be a twisting of the rails at tail hat. And this force, horizontal force, which is because of lateral thrust provided by the wheel flange on the side of the rail, that is resisted by the friction between the rail and the sleeper. So, a friction. This force is resisted by the friction force. And similarly, this little movement of the axle is resisted by the friction force between the rail surface and the wheel surface. So, and because of this, a torque is developed in the rail. And the amount of this torque it will depend upon the wheel load, eccentricity, condition of the track, and many more factors. Rail section force. The deflection in the rail can be measured only through only through strain gauges. But this horizontal force which is applied that can be taken for calculation of stresses around two tons. Then third force is the Longitudinal force. Longitudinal force on a rail. Longitudinal force on a rail is because of rolling wheels and driving wheels. Now this is the engine and then you have trailing load or train. Now when a train moves on the rails, the driving wheels of the engine apply force in the forward direction and when they apply the force in the forward direction they push the rail back. They push the rail back. That is the long-term force applied backward on the rail by the driving wheels of the engine. And when the these wheels, which are the trailing wheels, these wheels do not apply any force. They simply roll on the brakes. Similarly, when the brakes are applied by the engine, then braking force is also applied on the rails. Braking force is applied by all wheels because all wheels will try to slow down. And these forces depend upon the type of engine, weight of the weight of the engine, or you can say weight of the driving wheels, and number of trailing wheels. So on engine railways, it is suggested that roughly. This total force can be taken as 30 to 40 percent of weight of the engine. Weight of the engine. This is because of active effort. Because of active effort of the locomotive. As I told you, when they apply the load to pull the train, the destructive effort. So, tractive, uh, the longer force because of tractive effort can be taken 30 to 40 percent of weight of the engine. And for braking force, braking force can be taken as 
breaking force is 15 to 20 percent of engine weight and 10 to 15 percent of trailing weight. Huge force. You can imagine now 15 to 20 percent of weight of the engine and 10 to 15 percent of total trailing weight of the train. That is the breaking force. So that force that the, the rail must be able to, the rail surface should be so hard that it is able to resist this force. Then another one is the contact stress. And that is 
18.7 kg per millimeter square. Now this contact stress should not exceed at any point more than 30% of UTS of the ray. That is ultimate tensile strength of the ray. So for a 52 kg ray, for example, this UTS is ultimate tensile strength is 50 is 72 kg per millimeter square. And 30% of this 72 is 21.6. So this value should be less than 21.6 kg per millimeter square. That is the requirement. So these are different types of forces which act on the ray. So thank you very much for watching this video. In the next video, we will discuss stresses on sleepers, ballast, and formation.